my goodness. Oh my goodness, Capacity Crowd, thank you very much. My goodness me. Hello, welcome to this week's edition of uh, Life's a Pitch TV, live from Venue 16. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on podcast, you are most welcome. We really can't do it without you watching the show and listening to the show. And we hope you really, really enjoy it. We hope you do because we've got some good news for you. We've just crunched the stats today, everybody. And so far, we've only been going a few weeks, haven't we? We've had 94,124 views, which is amazing. And I reckon with your help, we'll smash 100,000 tonight. So well done. So thank you for watching and listening, which is brilliant. Uh, We're brought to you in association with our main sponsor, DPS Tech. Massive thank you to our other sponsors as well for making the show happen. That's all about hearing. Marketing company, Ginger Pickle, Forward Floors, Come Hither Design, The Hudson Group, Sound4 Pro Audio, Venue 16, Fred Olsen Logistics, and new sponsors, John Keeble Cars in Bramford. Let me introduce you to the team. It is Terry Butcher. It is Russell Osman. And it's Phil Ham from TWTD.co.uk. And we've got her up here already. Our special guest this week is the first lady of football. It is Dr. Pat Gobbles. Great stories to come from Pat in a little while, but also a big thank you to, to Richard, to Mark and John on Technicals who make it happen for us every week. So well done, guys. Thank you very, very much. And of course, you capacity crowd. Uh, couldn't do it without you either. Uh, we have got some uh, fantastic uh, stuff coming up very shortly. We've got uh, an opportunity for you to come and join us at Venue 16 on the 30th of November, the big Venue 16 Willow Suite here, when we're going to have a very special edition of uh, Christmas Life's a Pitch TV. We're going to film the show live in front of a big audience, and also we're going to have dinner, and then we're going to do a question of sport. And you two are the team captains, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> It says here. Correct. Are you, the, are you the question master? I am the question master. Oh, no, I'm in trouble. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the last time I did some questions for you was at the New Wolsey Theatre last year. Did any of you watch that show? Yeah, Terry's never forgiven me. And you were in it as well, weren't you, Pat? And Russell were there as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Grab, grab that microphone, Pat. Microphone, Look. Pat. Oh, sorry. Grab your microphone. That's when we played Charlton Away, wasn't it? 4 4. 4 4. Remember that, Matt? Yeah. It's a year. Next week. How time flies. I know, it really does. Uh, so, so you can book tickets on our website, lifesapitch.tv. There's also merchandise. Some of you have bought some merch tonight, haven't you? Yeah. Clearly not enough. <laughs> but thank you very much. There's mugs and T-shirts and everything there. Oh, Pat, how lovely to have you on the show this week. Oh, you my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Capacity what crowd. What was it like having a song like that for you? I'm overwhelmed with everything, Terry. The truth, when Terry rang last night and said, so and so, 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 I can't do that, Terry. He said, well, you were OK last year. Uh, so here I am and uh, hope we're going to have a lovely evening. I can't believe you're singing for me, but <laughs> it's, um, it's echoing round. I mean, I sing as well at Portman Road, but... Oh dear, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you get to you get to loads and loads of games as many as you can, don't you? What do you think about what's happening at the moment? Because it's mm. happening to us, everybody, at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's happening to us, Pat. I'm not getting too excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling Terry on the way here, we had a young boy in Ipswich boy as an apprentice way back in the fifties called Robin Baldry. And uh, he didn't make it. He was an apprentice, but he went on somewhere else. I think he's living in the Midlands, somewhere near where Russell comes from now. And uh, he wrote us, or to me really, an email at the end of the season. He was at the reunion last year. You probably saw him. And uh, he was overwhelmed with the town and everything. And he's put money on us 
to go up straight away. Fair play. I don't know what the odds were, but well, of I can remember. I can remember our very first Life's a Pitch show when we talked about predictions for the season ahead. And, and I said we will go up top two, and there was a lot of like, well, I'm not really sure about that, really sure about that. <laughs> Who's laughing now, boys? <laughs> I know there's a long way to go. Long and, way to go. I know, I know. I keep saying that. It's great, though, isn't it? Isn't it just fantastic? We love it. Um, what does this woman mean to you, Terry? Well, she means everything. I mean, I picked her up today and brought her down, and the journey lasted about 20, 25 minutes, and I learned more in those 25 minutes about Ipswich than I'd learned in the last 60. <laughs> she told me then, well, he used to live there, and Ian Collard lived over there, and Bobby used to live there, and did all that sort of thing, and there's St. Joseph's, and there was this, and there was that. And it was, it was remarkable. It was really nice. I thought she should be a, a tour guide going on these buses <laughs> and, and tell you, and, you know, a tour of Ipswich where all the players used to live and all this sort of thing. I mean, Anyone got an open top bus we could... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> it's just incredible. But she means, she means the world to us. When we played, when we were here, she was everything. She, you know, you treat her with reverence. She is the queen. She is royalty, a dame. She's, she's everything about Ipswich that's good. Everything about Ipswich that's right. And she wants things done proper. And I noticed before your pre-match talk was about not swearing. Well, she doesn't like it when people swear. And she hears me swear or Russell swear. <laughs> She'll be up to us the next time she sees us and tells us off. She does. She tells, and it's pretty fierce. I think she learned that from the gaffer. What about you, Russ? What does she mean to you? Well, I can't quite understand uh, that back in the late 70s, early 80s, how Pat could always track us down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah>. uh, <laughs> no mobile phones no. no at all no internet but you'd always get a message somewhere saying don't forget you've got the dentist this afternoon <laughs> so, all right so you've got no excuse anything how does she know that i was in the falcon pub <laughs> <laughs> But she's got this uncanny knack of just knowing exactly where you were, where you should be. Not just for me. You're talking about the whole of the staff at the football club. She looks after everybody. You know, and I'm talking about when I was like 15, 16, 17 years old. And it carried on until the day I left the club. Just the same now. And what do you think of these two, Pat? What, have you got any memories of these two when they first arrived? Were they Care, a little bit careful, unruly? Pat, careful now. Careful. Well, He's giving you a lift home, but don't let that put you <laughs> off. <laughs> I, I just love them. I love everybody. I, um, I could never imagine myself married. I, uh, I, I'm not a man-hater, obviously, but I, <laughs> I, I hated the thought of her going home and washing men's dirty socks and things like that. And I just... I just love the club, and I felt as if I was married to the club. And these boys still mean so much to me. And as you know, we have the reunions, and every year, Mr. Butcher wasn't very kind to me last year, but I'll, I'm trying to forgive him. <laughs> and, uh, You're going to get it. Yes. <laughs> I'll be even worse this year, I'll tell <laughs> you next year. <laughs> but I, I kept in touch with them all. And we've had these reunions over 40 years now, and I did organise them on my own for about 20 years, and then I retired from full-time. But I can't imagine my life without this football club and without these players. And during COVID, I was also shielded. My phone didn't stop. And fantastic flowers from Rita and Terry, and, and things like that. It just means so much to me. And uh, I love Ipswich Town, and I've been supporting them since 1946. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I am excited in a way about now. We've just been talking about the new manager. Oh, he, I get on very well with him, but don't see much of them because they're training at the training ground, and I only work will actually work properly on one morning a week, although I'm volunteering and some of you are here now, which I saw yesterday at the various cafe uh, we have at the club now. I just can't keep myself away. <laughs> um, I think, um, well, I did say after I uh, came out of shielding to the company secretary, now what would you like me to do with working? He said, you come what you like, when you like. You do what you like and you go home what you like. <laughs> At 86, that wasn't bad, was it? But, <laughs> but Mark, Mark, I remember... 
when we were when we were young and and I was courting, I got married before Russell. Uh, I always remember Pat saying, you know, after, when we got married, um, what dinner service would you like? I says, what do you mean what dinner service? That was normally on the wedding gifts. But she organized a dinner service in, in Bone China for us as a, as a wedding present from the football club. And she did that. So, you know, you, you, little things like that, he's just, just remarkable, really is. So many comments that I've had in on our socials, social media about you, some lovely, lovely comments and people saying just how thoughtful you are and, and I've had phone calls from you, even though I'm not an ex-player, I've had phone calls from you asking how am I. And so you really do care about these people, you care about the club and the people that you meet. I care about, well I, I have never married, I've got a fantastic brother with a lovely family and I had a fantastic mother and it's through my father actually that I started watching the town and I, mummy always said do what's your best do your best whenever you can and if you go shopping for the old lady up the road you don't take anything for it you're doing it because you wanted to help her and I've tried all my life to help everybody and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm 88 now, and I'm hoping, uh, and I've been here 69 years working. I hope I might get 70 to do 70 years working here. I think there's many, many more years to come I from you, know. Pat. Let's but, take you, uh, let me take you back, though. When you, uh, what was your first job at Ipswich Town, and, and can you remember your first day? Yes, I had worked for Revels four years before, and uh, it's a long story how I got the job. I'm still in the guides and uh, uh, I, I was saying uh, we are oldies, senior guides now. I joined when I was seven, and I went to Switzerland in our chalet um, uh, in 1957 or something, and a friend of mine worked at Lloyd's Bank, and we had just won the third division south, mm -hmm. and Scott Duncan, the old boy, was the manager, and the director thought it was time that he had somebody to help him with his paperwork, etc., But he didn't want to advertise a job. He didn't know what sort of lady or person would apply. And he went to Lloyd's Bank manager, who he was friendly with, and he told him, he said, if you hear of anybody, he said, must be a shorthand typist to help me. And so the manager spoke to the lady, say, You're, you girls are always moaning about working here. Scott Duncan's looking for a secretary at Portman Road. Must be interested in football, obviously, and to shorthand typist. Well, I'd been talking to my friends in Ardleboden, and she told him, and that's how I got the job. But um, I went for an interview at the office, but it was a Nissan hut during the war, and it was all, we had to put um, dishes and plates and things, cups, to catch the drips coming through the, <laughs> the ceiling. Anyway, I had the interview. He actually dictated a letter to me ordering a set of gold nets from Harrods of Lowestoft, and we still use them, actually, and they've been used in World Cup, so Lowestoft is on the map there. And then he said, I must speak to the chairman, who was uh, Alastair Cobbold, the older one, but not as eccentric as Mr. John was. I'll tell you about him sometime later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he said, we'll be in touch, and he invited me back. I was working at Revels for four years, five shillings increase each of the four years, and uh, I was then earning 27 and 6 when I went there. Anyway, when Scott sent the letter, I was offered £4.15 a week. I thought, golly, my goodness, I'm <laughs> in clover here. And he said, welcome to Portman Road. I hope you're going to be very happy. Watch out for the married ones. They're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was interested in this old fuddy-duddy. <laughs> they didn't want to know anything about me, and I've loved looking after all these boys. I don't know how many hundreds, but I loved you Thousands all. Thousands, probably, I would imagine, over the years. So, yes. so what was Scott Duncan like? He's, he's someone that perhaps the younger general, or even the sort of some of us in our, Scott, in our 50s don't really know too much about. Scott Duncan, he actually was a Scottish international. He played for Manchester United and shared a room when they played for Scotland with Matt Busby. And uh, they got him down here. I don't really know the story, but I think the transfer fee was a crate of white wine. Wasn't there, wasn't, isn't, there, isn't there a story about... <laughs> isn't there Which, a story about a kidnap or something like that around that? Well, I don't know anything about kidnaps. <laughs> 
Um, We've kidnapped your manager or something like that, and then they sent them the... I hope so nobody can kidnap our manager now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sorry, so that's OK. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted, young man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, hey, hey. I, I don't mind being called young man these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's younger than me. <laughs> Oh, dear, I don't know. I ramp on. I talk too much. No, I'm not at all. You keep going. We're in for the night, aren't we, everybody? <laughs> yeah. Check, check the last bus. Um, um, so, so, so who was next, then, on the, uh, on the managerial line? Uh, Alf Ramsey. Sky, we, we were relegated, you see, the first year. And I thought they'd get rid of me now. We were relegated. <laughs> and uh, Alf had not managed anywhere, had he? And uh, he was with Tottenham, and they were actually, I think, co coaching or something out in South Africa. And uh, he, he came down, and obviously uh, he was the man for the job. And fantastic man, but I didn't get to know him. He was a very, very personal man, whole family. I didn't really get to know him. But uh, he knew football, inside and out. But Mr. John didn't know anything about football, so they got on OK together. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one or two stories. I don't really know where to start. But oh, well, you can carry you just on. carry on. No, no, I'm going to sit on. back and listen, <laughs> no. uh, Pat. I'm going to sit back and listen like everybody else. Just I mean, the, the, the Ramsey era was a fantastic era, though, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, success came to the club, didn't it, like never before? Yes. The only... Uh, the only um, club to have won the top division at the first attempt... Now, my brother and I are always moaning about four or five years ago when Leicester were. And Leicester, they reckon, had never done anything like it before. Never. We had never, ever played in the top division. And straight up from the second to the first, we won it. Leicester, when they won it, they had been in the top division before. Yeah, and I remember the day that we won a uh, division outside our old offices or... This and huts and whatever. Um, there's a chap called Newman Sanders. I think it was a BBC local television. And uh, he interviewed Alf. Uh, and he said, well done, Alf. He said, uh, you've won the championship of the first division. He said, never been known before. How do you feel? Alf said, I feel fine. <laughs> No sign of emotion at all. Not like Mr. R. Bobby Robson, I call him Mr. R. And, uh, I mean, the boys will probably know this. I think it might have been Cologne. When he was sitting in a seat on his own and we scored a goal or something, he went mad running around the pitch and running around the car. <laughs> anyway, uh, fantastic. Some of them have been wonderful people. Others I haven't got on quite so well with. But uh, thoroughly enjoyed. Mr. R was his... PA for 36 years, looked after his house in uh, Constitution Hill when he was away. I had a key and they had a breakdown, so the police are after me and uh, <laughs> <laughs> all sorts. But a fantastic career. What about, let's just go back to Alf just for a moment or two, because yeah. the, the, we've got a shirt here. Who's, who, who's got the shirt with Ray Crawford on? Oh. Yeah, see, look at the shirt, Pat. You can see the... The old oh. blue shirt with the old badge on there, number well nine, done. signed I... by Ray Crawford on the front. Crawford and Phillips, what a, oh. what a couple of blokes. Yes, t uh, Ted was a nutcase. <laughs> um, I, s I keep in touch with Ray, and I don't know if you know that there's going to be a Garden of Remembrance at Portman Road, at the corner of Churchman's, let's all call it Churchman's, where you come round the back into Portman Road, and I keep my eye on it. It's supposed to be ready by the beginning of August. will soon be the beginning of November. But all the people whose ashes have been buried are scattered at the ground. They had a, a little ceremony, because we've dug the pitch up, as you know, the old pitch, and people whose family, and Ted Phillips, his ashes were buried at Portman Road, along with lots of other former town players and staff. And they're now going to be invited with... It is going to be, on the wall at the back is all their names. I've been watching her, they've been going, and I, I often say to the workmen, come on, get on with it, because of, <laughs> it, it's time we had this. And Ted Phillips, well, I could tell you so many stories of Ted. Like, 
a road run. We used to do a lot of running on the roads. Do you don't they don't do that now, do they? Running on the roads? No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> well done. You don't like it either, did you? <laughs> you know, we normally did it on a Saturday night after we'd won. Oh, yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> from well, from pub Phillips. to pub, I think it was, yeah. <laughs> Ted Phillips, one day, he got a lift on the back of a lorry. <laughs> and they used to run up Chevalier Street, or you call it Chevalier, and some of the houses, they come right onto the pavement, and the milkman would leave the bottles, of glass bottles of milk. You know what I'm going to say? Ted would take one, and on his way, he was a right nutcase. And the things... He would... In Elf's day, I don't think they do it now, but on a Friday morning, if we're playing on a Saturday, Alf did not let them have a football to train with. They didn't have a football. Ted Phillips was living at Colchester, came in on the train, always got there early. But on a Thursday, before Charlie Cowie got the chance to pick up all of the footballs, Charlie was a... Well, I don't... He was supposed to be a trainer, come odd job man, wash the socks man, everything. Uh, he came down from Scotland. And... Uh, he, uh, he goes around with the bag to collect the balls after training on the Thursday, always one missing. And he used to tell Elf, he said, I don't know what's happened. He said, so Elf said to me one day, see if you can find it. I think Phillips hides them. Up the floodlight towers, behind our office in the coke, where the coke was used to boil the water for the showers and everything. And there was always one missing, but... They never did find where, where... In a turnstile, right down the other Empress Rink <laughs> corner of the ground. It's just amazing he was. But he's, his ashes are there along with others. And I think maybe Ray Crawford might come back for that because he's still very much an Ipswich man. And uh, although he's Portsmouth, that's where he lives and that's where he played. But when he comes to reunions, people say to me, what, is, what has he got? Let's bottle whatever he's got, because he still looks fantastic, He looks he? younger every time, doesn't he? <laughs> yes. He really he's like, does. He's like Peter Pan, isn't he? He really is. <laughs> yes. But did you know, we were on the radio, Pat, quite a while ago doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. And then we had Ray Crawford, and then you came on. And what was the question that you asked Ray on live radio? Was that the last time you did it? Last yeah, end of yeah. last it was, season. It was before, just before COVID. Mm. Yes. And Ray was talking about being in hospital, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, and he couldn't remember why he was in hospital, but Pat could. Mm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> before the season finished, he had a bit of an uncomfortable complaint, and uh, they decided that they would leave it and operate at the end of the season. And uh, I went to see him when he did go in, and. Uh, he had piles, <laughs> and he was in the ears, nose, and throat ward. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, of course, yes. <laughs> it went up a long way then. <laughs> <laughs> he hoped they'd find him the, the right knife, whatever. <laughs> Oh, dear. That was a funny moment. That really was a funny yeah. moment. And, uh, yeah, I love that. Um, let me bring you to him because let, let's talk about the Robson era and, of course, no, no better people to ask and talk to Pat about those, those times. So I'm going to throw it over to you guys now for a bit. <laughs> I like with Mr Robson. Well, he was... He made life, life very easy for us because all he wanted us to do was go out and play football and behave and took his shirt in. And every day for a home game, or every day just going out at three o'clock, we used to only go out like five minutes before the game started. Not like today when they have a half an hour warm up, and then they come in for five minutes and go out. We used to go out at like five to three, 10 to three, something like that. And the last thing Mr. R would say to me would, took his shirt in. He said it to Walkie, took his shirt in, to Mana, took his shirt in. So we'd all go down the corridor, took in a shirt in. As soon as you got on the pitch, out came the shirt again. <laughs> but he was, he was a, a bit of a stickler, uh, a stickler for um, doing things the right way. Certain disciplines that he insisted upon. It, it, it was strange because you'd come out of the, the shower room where the toilets were and everything, and if you bumped into him, he'd say... Uh, have you washed your hands, son? He say, yeah, of course I've washed my hands. You know, I did, you know. <laughs> but it's this constant reminder of how your standards should be and how he wanted the standards set all the time. And he was, a, like I say, a stickler for stuff like that. And he used to do everything, didn't he? 
around the club. The stories I hear that he kind of would pick the carpet and he would do all these. Did things. Did he do that, Pat? He was. He was. I mean, he was, he was across just about everything, wasn't he? Yes, they, we didn't have very often monthly board meetings, but very often we had to f to uh, agree the transfer of sh company shares. Anyway, uh, he uh, he he was one of these people who uh, I don't know why, but. He just wanted to be involved in everything. And Mr. John, who didn't know anything about football, he was a fantastic man, and he, he had the right things in the right mind. But anyway, he would say, Bobby, can you see to that? Ladies' toilet, they'd had a complaint. <laughs> so he'd come in with, with a list of things that they'd asked him to do. Now, can you help me? Go and see what they're talking about, ladies' toilets. But um, <laughs> you're talking about uh, Mr... John and uh, Mr. Pat, they were great, weren't they? Yes, <laughs> Mr. Patrick was great, but he was a bit more level-headed, perhaps you would say. <laughs> that wasn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't so drunk, I don't think. That no. was the case. Well, can I just? I was at the meeting yesterday, and the gentleman gave me this, and I'd heard about the end of this story. This was a cutting this gentleman took out of the express last week. And it's headed, when eccentrics roamed free in the beautiful game. Perhaps you've heard of this. Duncan Hamilton's superb account of England's 1966 World Cup victory has just been named as the favourite to win the William Hill Sports Book of the Year. And no wonder. It is full of vivid incidents and rich characters like the eccentric permanently thirsty John Cobbold, <laughs> <laughs> the chairman of Ipswich Town who gave the great Alf Ramsey his first job as a club manager. Then they go on to tell the story, but I'm going to tell a story that Mr R told me and you've just reminded me. On the way home from a match, the boys travelled most of the games in the coach, come back uh, for a comfort stop. And Mr. R and Mr. John went into the same area. Mr. John R came out, was washing his hands. Mr. John came out, started to walk straight out the door. And Mr. R said, Mr. John, where I came from, they taught us to wash our hands when we'd been to the toilet. And Mr. John returned to him and he said, Bobby, where I came from, they told us not to pee on our hands. <laughs> Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> yeah, she'll be asking you later if you nip off after the show. Um, but but those, those moments, the, the, the chairman, Mr John, was just like nothing else, wasn't he? Just like nothing else. Uh, I mean, there is quite a few books about him. Uh, um, but there's a lot that you could write about him that wouldn't be... We couldn't print it, no, could no, we? No. A little incident in uh, Florida, um, Japanese restaurant. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. He was um, too much sake, I think. He was very persuasive when it came to drink. You didn't dare refuse to have a drink, and <laughs> in, invariably, when you saw him, he had a drink in his hand, and he would get you one as well. So, and everybody else, very generous man. Um, the, the gaffer Bobby, you know, they 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 worked well together, didn't they? So they understood each other yeah. very well. I and think Mr. Pat as well. Sorry, I think one of the great things about the board of directors at that time was that whether you were playing for the youth team on a Saturday morning and travelling away, or whether you were playing for the reserves and travelling to an away game, there was always at least one director on the coach with the coach who's in charge of that squad. So if you're going up to the Midlands, if you're going up to Manchester for a reserve team game, or you're going into London and play Chelsea in the reserves, it'd be Mr. John, Mr. Pat, Mr. Smith, Murray Sangster, Mr. Kerr. At least one of them would travel with the reserves all the time. Super support. Yeah. So, they, so they knew what they were doing. They were, you know, they were, you know, the head of a very successful club, weren't they? They knew what they were doing, yeah. keeping you know, Bobby Robson on board for and as free long as they possibly as well. could. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't think they knew what they were doing when we went into Europe because you never saw them. And they, if you did see them, they were lying on the floor, things like this. 
I mean, they really enjoyed themselves. And I think one director actually missed the game because he was, he Mr. was drunk. Kerr. Mr. Kerr. Yeah. yeah. He was <laughs> drunk. Alleg allegedly. Actually, allegedly. <laughs> I remember a great story about Mr. John. And, and I think Mr. John got there to the hotel with the players and they're all checking in. And the press used to travel with us at the same time on the same plane. So all the press boys, they were a bit boozy. They liked to go straight into the bar and have a few drinks. Our directors went and had a few drinks in there. But Mr. John hadn't been in the bar for a while, and he came down later on, about an hour, hour and a half later. And one of the press lads said to him, where have you been, Mr. John? We've been having a great time here. We've, we've had plenty to drink. It's going great. Mr. John said, dear boy, I have been in my room, and I, ha I have drunk my fridge half dry already. <laughs> so kind of, well, why only half, Mr. John? He says, well, I don't like minerals, do I? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, Mr. D Mr. John owned a brewery, so, you know, if you, you were in insurance, you went round to en encourage people to take out their car insurance with you. So Mr. John, well, he was, you know, advertising his wares. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Damn good job of it. Didn't he, used to, didn't he used to host parties and stuff at uh, his place? Yeah, yeah, we can't remember them, but they were good parties. Well, when yeah. they were donkeys, weren't they? Oh, shall I tell you about? Tell oh. us about the donkeys. Yeah. Well, Mr. John had a fantastic house, uh, with acres, twenty thousand acres of land down at Trimley. Although Trimley was on the right-hand side of the main go road going down to Felixstowe, Capel Hall, Trimley, was Mr. John's home. It belonged to the Cobolds way back 1780s, Thomas Cobold, and it went down. Mr. John was never married, but um, that's another story. And uh, uh, he, li <laughs> he, lived there al he lived there alone. Anyway, uh, he um, came into the office one day, um, and he'd got two donkeys. And he said, what do you think? Uh, I've got two donkeys. Uh, I called them Alka and Seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> because he more or less lived on Alka Seltzer as well as his drink. So then he was excited one day and he said, Pat, Pat, he said, my donkeys have had a, a baby fall. He said, do you know what I've called it? I said, knowing you, Mr. John, it could have been anything. He said, I've called it Burp. <laughs> And going back to the donkeys as well, um, I mean, he was a bit eccentric, wasn't he? But he yeah, was lovely. He was very generous, wasn't he? Oh, generous. Well, there's really a story generous. about when you boys won something, and I can't remember, away, and you went into Walkie's and PM's bedroom and had drinks. And they went down in the morning, and, uh, oh, dear, got paid this drink spill. Oh, oh good yeah. heavens, however much is it? <laughs> Well, I've got a tenner, I've got a fiver, what shall we do? Mr. John came along and he said, uh, what's the matter, boys? Well, Mr. John, we had a bit of a party in our room last night. Several of the boys came and we're just looking at the bill. He said, don't worry, I'll pay it. Yeah, just like that. That was, that was the PFA Awards when we, we scooped the first three positions, I think, for yeah, the players. Was it? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was, yes. um, what was it, the Hilton Park Lane or something yes. like that? Yeah. It was quite a night, that, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it? We, we, another... we were in the room next door, yeah, it was very good. <laughs> There's another story about the donkeys. Um, I, can't rem... <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember where we were playing. Manchester United away, and I used to go to some of the away matches, and they... that was a time when Leeds United and West Ham well, supporters were not too good. Anyway, we got a bad name in England for uh, supporters away, but the, uh, somebody said, well, I don't know, this Ipswich town, they're doing well, you don't hear of them with any problems. We'll follow them with a BBC camera, or I don't know which one it was. And I remember getting off the train at um, Piccadilly, Manchester, and they were filming, and some, one of them said, is this really football crowd? They're not making any noise. But they asked Mr. John, could they do any more behind the scenes? He said, yes, I'd like you to meet my directors. Come down to my house and we'll see the, the other directors. So this beautiful house, you know, go through the, oh, this lovely through down into the terrace and out onto the um, lawns and everything. He said, this is the remainder of my board. And there was the two donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
I remember I've heard a story like that where uh, there was a prospective signing that he took to, to the, and uh, he showed, showed them to the dog and he put the signing off. He thought this guy was so mad that I he couldn't sign. But there's a story about a monkey as well, isn't there? Have you oh, heard? dear. <laughs> I, uh, I really don't know that proper story. I think it was the way to Liverpool or something. Was it but Blackpool or somewhere like that? It, well, it? it could have been. It's, not, it's the same Lancashire anyway. I don't know. <laughs> But I never did hear the proper story of uh, the... Well, the, tell us your version of it. Well, I, I don't know. He took a monkey and, I don't know, trying to do tricks or something and left it with them. He didn't want to take it any further. But the, this, 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 <laughs> the, the, the version of the story I heard was that they went down to the front, the promenade, and there was a guy who had a monkey that was doing tricks. And so he bought the monkey off him and took it in the boardroom. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this monkey was flying everywhere. Around this room. It wouldn't have been Burnley because he didn't like Bob Lord, their chairman. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the, oh, sorry. I mean, no, no, no. They, they, I mean, they are just fantastic moments that, that all of you lived through. I mean, never they were be, just fantastic. Never be women. repeated. No. Most no. Were I mean, it was just, did you realise at the time just how magical this moment no, was? No, I don't was? think I, I did. I yeah. don't, it wasn't until afterwards, you know, that you realise how good we were, what a great club we were. It shows what respect Mr John had in the game when he passed away and we had the service here and I laid on refreshments and everything and people came from all over. Liverpool hired a plane for Liverpool and Everton directors to come down here just for the service. So that showed the respect they had for the man. But Mr John, Pat, when we used to drive down the main drive to a game on a Saturday... He would be standing at the window in the boardroom, and as you drove to go underneath the window, he would be stood there going. <laughs> <laughs> For those listening on podcast, flicking the bees. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Oh dear. Well, Pat, I've had a message for you. Uh, this is from uh, Stephen Bayfield. Oh. Uh, can you ask Pat if she will relate the story of when she went with Mr. R and his sons? to a John Cobbold Christmas party at Cable Hall, and the old gamekeeper was asked to assist the magician. <laughs> Can you remember that? Well, I, I think he's probably got a little bit wrong, but if he's not very well, we'll forgive him. But um, <laughs> He's uh, got COVID at the moment. It, so, uh, yeah. Well done. It's lovely to hear from him. The Reverend Pulpit... Yes. He's on BBC, or used to be on BBC Radio Suffolk. Yeah, we don't talk about them anymore. No, sorry. We, we all used to be on the BBC. <laughs> Suffolk, <laughs> on, moving on, Suff moving Suffolk on. Sound. <laughs> moving on. Anyway, he's a very good supporter. But when Captain Ivan, Mr John and Mr Patrick's father, was unfortunately killed in the Guards Chapel in June 1944, Mr John was still only a teenager and uh, lived at Glenham Hall. You've probably seen this beautiful big house on the way to Lowestoft on the right. And we've had lots of parties there pre-season. Uh, but Mr John tried, perhaps with a hindrance or not much help from his mother, Lady Blanche, who had to have a say in everything, wonderful lady she was, a lady in her own right. And uh, he, tr he had a party one Christmas for the estate workers and their family and also for the um, uh, villagers and their families. And he had a conjurer. And Miss Lee wanted, the conjurer wanted somebody to go and help him on the stage. Nobody volunteered. So eventually, Mr. John said to uh, Bixby, who was the gamekeeper, he said, uh, you've heard it, John. <laughs> heard this story, have you? Not to worry. He was a gamekeeper on the estate. And... Uh, he went up there and this conjurer said to him, Now, Mr Bixby, what would you say if I pulled a rabbit from your trousers pocket? So Bixby says, Well, no, boy. He said, That would be a bloody miracle because that's where I keep my ferret. <laughs> Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise... I'm sorry. I didn't realise people were listening to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, listening and watching, yeah. No. Yeah, you want a camera over there, look. <laughs> <laughs> oh! I've got 
thinking, what's the moon doing up there? <laughs> Lovely. That's lighting especially for us, Pat. Um, look, we're going to come back and talk some more in a moment or two because oh, you've got pity. some wonderful <laughs> stories. But uh, for, for now, Pat Gobold, everybody. <laughs> Fantastic. There's more to come, don't you worry. Um, now, look, I have got a football here because um, ordinarily we would do the Keepy Uppy Challenge sponsored by uh, Ginger Pickle. Um, this is the ball, everybody, that you see us having a go at every week. Um, but unfortunately, if you look, and I'm not sure if the cameras can pick it up, but we are in a room with chandeliers. <laughs> and, and Pat, did you want to have a go or not? <laughs> no. <laughs> so maybe, just maybe, should we let her off? I think so. I think so. Okay. And it will. Uh, so let's have uh, the news uh, with uh, Phil Ham from twtd.co.uk. And he's got his Paddington hat on. The news. <laughs> My news hat. This was uh, a gift from the North American Sporters Club last yeah. week. Yeah, doesn't it? he look like Paddington? Yeah. With the blue to, shirt, it does seem to have the red hat. You should have seen our WhatsApp group after the show last week. <laughs> <laughs> there was me thinking I looked like Richie Richardson or, you know, a West Indies cricketer or something. No, no Paddington. Paddington Bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, the Life's a Pitch TV news. Kieran, uh, Kieran McKenna, nominated for Manager of the Month. Yep, well hey. done. After Town's unbeaten September, only points have dropped in the, uh, the draw at... The 1 1 draw at Huddersfield and also progressed to round four of the Carabao Cup via a 3 2 win over Premier League Wolves. He's up against Tony Mowbray at Sunderland, Liam Rossini of Hull, two ex town players, of course, uh, and Errol Bullet from uh, Cardiff. Now, Town have beaten all three of them, only Cardiff in September, so you'd think he'd get the award, wouldn't you? Yeah. We'll see you in the morning. And um, we don't worry about the curse of the manager of the month? We're not. We're too good for that now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is we haven't got a game Saturday. So, <laughs> so that works out quite nicely on that front. Um, if, if he does win, it will be his first championship award, having won the League One gongs in March and April. Uh, but most of us say we've not got a game this weekend. Uh, international international uh, football is on the is top of the agenda. Uh, Wes Burns and Nathan Broadhead last night were in action for Wales and had contrasting fortunes. Uh, during their 4 0 victory over Gibraltar. Uh, Nathan Broadhead scored his second international goal, but Wes Burns fell awkwardly on his left shoulder and was subbed in the 15th minute. Bit of a worry for everyone, really, isn't it? I think. Um, maybe a collarbone injury, maybe a dislocation. He's back at town for assessment, but hopefully good news. Um, it's the second Wales game that Wes Burns has suffered a, an injury, which is frustrating. He came back last time with a hamstring problem, so. Uh, his international career is not helping town at the moment, so hopefully that's nothing too serious. Various other players have won caps. Elkan Bagup this afternoon for Indonesia won 6-0 against Brunei. Um, young keeper Woody Williamson was with Scotland's under-19s. Uh, Janoy Danassian with, is, is playing for St Lucia in, in, in the small hours. Um, but the main event of the international week, from a town perspective, Massimo Luongo and Cameron Burgess facing England at Wembley on Friday evening. Uh, Luongo's first England call in four years. So uh, that's a big one for, uh, for us all to watch. It'd be nice for both of them to get some minutes at Wembley, mm. wouldn't it? Uh, and young keeper Henry Gray, who we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, was training with the New Zealand squad. Uh, he's actually been given a squad number now. So um, he will be on the bench for their game against Congo DR, although will be the third keeper. So, uh, but still a feather in his cap at 18 to be uh, in the in the, in the foot. And... and on a different international front, Reese Topley, uh, a town fan, uh, born in Ipswich, at the Cricket World Cup. I tweeted a photo this afternoon of a town fan at the Australia-South Africa match this afternoon. looking. Uh, he looked like an Australian because of his reaction to an Auss Aussie dropping a catch, but apparently one of his mates then tweeted, well, actually, he's from Essex and he's an England fan, so I don't know why he was getting so uh, upset about that. But um, Reese Topley's a town fan. I don't know this is widely known. Um, but took 4 for 43 in England's 137-run victory over Bangladesh on Tuesday. So hats off to him for that, and Fantastic. hopefully he can keep England going. Brilliant. There Brilliant. endeth the news. That's the news. Brought off to comes the hat. <laughs> Sponsored by John Keeble Cars. That's the first time he's ever had applause for, for the news. That's very good. Thank you very much. It, it must be the cricket? hat that's doing it. Right. Okay. This, this is the best crowd we've ever had, I must say. It is. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it is it's, it's much bigger and better than last week. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Russell, um, on this day yes, in history, um, brought to you in association with Fred Olsen Logistics, 
What have you got for us in your little almanac there of Ipswich Town facts? Yes, Ipswich Town on this day, the history of facts and figures. Um, it's been quite good, actually, because every show we've done has coincided with it being an interesting stat. Well, it's quite a thick book, so it's every chance. It is really, a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Wednesday the 12th of October, 1977. England beat Luxembourg 2-0 in Luxembourg in a World Cup qualifier. It was the ninth and final cap that Mr Beattie made. Sad. Should have had more, shouldn't he? Should he have had more? He really should have had more England He should have had a lot more. Yeah, a lot more. And the goal scorer that night was Paul Mariner. So, great player. Two lads that we'll miss for, for a long time. Also, on Wednesday the 12th of October 1994, Town beat Ipswich Wanderers 7-3 at Humberdoosie Lane. <laughs> Not quite a classic. That was to celebrate the opening of the home team's floodlights. Chris Kawamia scored four goals in front of 600 fans. And that all happened on this day on the 12th of October. Fantastic, mm. Fan well, fantastic that. stuff. <laughs> Brought to you in association with Fred Olsen Logistics. Now, Pat, time for some more for you now. We've got some questions for you. Um, this is... Uh, sorry. <laughs> thought I'd give you... Sorry, sorry, no, I was Give you a little... <laughs> She was listening to your every word. She was just resting her eyes. Well, I must, I must say, by her reaction and her memory, there must be something in that coffee she had before the show. So <laughs> if, you do well, want a, if you do want a cushion or a pillow, we'll get you one, Pat. It's no problem. Okay. That um, was a lovely cup of coffee who made it for you. This has Thank come you. through. Um, great guest, such a lovely lady. ITFC through and through. Knew my mum, nan and granddad from the Bobby Robson days when you could travel on the team bus and fly to the European Games. Uh, she helped sign a commemorative book on his 80th birthday. Nothing was ever too much trouble. So again, um, some are remembering your, your thoughtfulness, really. And did fans really go on the coach and on the planes together? Yeah, yes, we, I don't know about the team coach, no. I only went on the team coach once when I went to um, Norwich. Uh, <laughs> But they were very kind. Thank you. It was um, Anglia Television to show our cup final again, I think, and I went then. But though the fans didn't go on our coach, but to help us to pay for the aircraft when we did go uh, fly away anywhere, we did have fans go and whatever they paid helped towards that. So we had people like Trevor Lucas from the Old Cop Dock Hotel. I don't know if anybody knew him. And friends of the Charlie Manning, who yep. knew Charlie oh, Manning from Charlie. the amusement park down at Felix Stowe. Oh, he was a he was a character, wasn't he? Yeah. Did you have a suitcase, or he had a suitcase, and you signed it? A tiny suitcase with just his pajamas <laughs> in. And then when they were away and it was very cold, he would wear his pajamas and put his trousers over the top <laughs> to keep warm at the matches. <laughs> On top of his long I johns. didn't see him, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is fabulous. This is a brilliant question that's come in here. Um, you are an Ipswich Town living legend, but which actor would you like to play the part of Pat Gobold in the 2030 film covering the history of ITFC and their return to European trophy winners? <laughs> so who would you like to play you in a, in a film about Ipswich Town, Pat? I don't know any other a actresses. Or do okay. I don't follow films and things. Who would I? Who would Who I would I um, Helen Mirren. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Good Dame, call, Dame Judi Dench. Good call. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I. I Lady Gaga. <laughs> 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 Not Lady Cadaver. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't really know. <laughs> That's for somebody else to say, surely. What, what would you have, Mark? What actor would you have your role? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Oh, my goodness me. Mr Tumble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Humpty Dumpty. Or something like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Got 
Not Are feeling. you Russ? Who are you doing? <laughs> Don't get me in the pod in that. <laughs> 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 Film star already played himself. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you played yourself. Yeah, yeah. What about yeah. Phil Hamm? Yeah, Who would play Hamm. Phil Hamm in well, a film? It's going to be Telly Savalas, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yul Brynner. <laughs> Yul Brynner, Telly Savalas. I was. I, I'm left out here. I was uh, Liam Neeson would play me. Oh, right, Who's okay. He? Yeah, because I could shoot people. That'd be lovely. Don't look at me when you say that. I'll get a bit worried. I once took Bobby Ferguson... Used to have a used to pull me do pull me out and say, you know, it was a journey down good and all that sort of thing. And he said, what you know, what would you really like to do, you know, if you could, what would you really like to do and, and get away with it? I said, I'd like to stick an axe in someone's back. <laughs> <laughs> but during a game, in, well, <laughs> in, <laughs> he that's never, the ultimate tackle from behind. <laughs> yeah, he, he never asked me again. Funny. <laughs> 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 No, it's true. I'm not blinded. I'm not picking up. It's true. <laughs> Sandra Squirrel's been in touch. Proud to say this lady is my cousin. She is like a stick of rock with Ipswich running right through. Blue and white. She, it, Sandra. Oh. Sandra oh, Squirrel. Oh, Sandra. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hello, Sandra and yeah. Gary. Hope you're yeah. all well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well done. You don't get this on national podcasts, <laughs> do you? <laughs> She li- they live in Stowe Market, you know. Right. Old country Stowe Market. Yes, uh, yes. Glenda Price as well. Uh, cousin Pat, as yeah. my mum always used to call her. Heard her often on the radio. Her stories of ITFC are brilliant. Um, and yeah. do you have any other little anecdotes or stories that you would like to bring to us before we start to wrap up this evening's proceedings, Pat, over oh, the so many years that you've been at Ipswich Town? 69 seasons. Wow. <laughs> I, I I just can't think of anything really, but hope that the town continue to do well. And I'm I don't think the boys know this, but I've got something that they haven't got: football memory, football. You know, last May, fortunately, we were only runners up, but that was great. We got into the championship, and all the players were given a medal, and I've had one. And you, and you also had you also got an award from the LMA as well, didn't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. About six seasons ago, I was recommended LMA League Managers Association, and they vote for somebody each season a, a outstanding contribution to football, and mine was to football and Ipswich Town in general, and I I was I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely overwhelmed, and I. David Rose came with me because I felt David had contributed to do it switch down as well. Mm. David joined the club eight years after I did. He's just that eight years younger than me. Anyway, um, we were taken by the club chauffeur, the, you know, par- the Grosvenor Hotel, Park Lane, and 900 guests. And uh, I was amazed. Uh, George, I don't know who actually put my name forward, I think it was Charlie Woods. We got on exceptionally well at Portman Road, as they all love Charlie. And uh, there was 900 guests, we sat down to dinner. Uh, <laughs> a little story about uh, Sam Allardyce sat next to me. And there was another seat beside him that somebody didn't turn up. But they still put the meals around on the table. Sam, <laughs> Sam devoured that meal as well. No one is a big man. <laughs> but uh, he and, and George Burley was asked to get up and introduce me. They came to Portland Road and filmed David Rose and me previous, and that was shown up on the screens. Have you ever been to an LMA evening? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. managers, secretaries. I used to go with them years ago to the Royal Lancaster. Um, but uh, this particular night, Sam said to me, Pat, when you go to make your speech... He said, say something about the kobolds. I said, I'm not making a speech. He said, yes, you have to make a speech. Well, I had prepared a few words to say thank you. Thank you for whoever recommended me to have this award. Thank you for the LMA, et cetera. And uh, then I said, "Uh, I, I can't believe these people who are here... I wouldn't be standing here if I hadn't enjoyed my job so so much. I said, and it was due to working with and for such lovely people, including John Duncan was there, 
Um, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea, unfortunately, but uh, the late John, and I got on very well with him. Chris Kawami was there. Um, there was uh, all sorts of people, David Sheepshanks, David Rose, anyway. So I said, he's asked me to, somebody's asked me to tell you about the Cobbold family. So I'm looking around all these people. Can you come back next week? I'll have more time to tell you stories about the Cobbold family. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one little story I said I must tell you about Lady Blanche Cobbold. She is a lady in her own right, the daughter of the ninth Duke and Duchess of uh, Devonshire from Chatsworth House. You probably know it well. And uh, uh, she was at the FA Cup final when Ipswich Town beat the Arsenal, and there were some cheers or some boos went up from the crowd, and I said, very proud that we won it. But before we went out to the uh, match, I was privileged to be invited into the banqueting hall for a, a meal before the match. And after the meal, somebody asked her ladyship if she would like to meet the Prime Minister. And she said, no, thank you. I would rather have a G&T. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Gobbold, everybody. Um, just before we go, the Man V Fat results have just come through on my laptop, which I spilled beer on earlier, and it is working, everybody, so it's okay. Uh, Man V Fat results uh, this week Pork Vale 7, Toulouse a few pounds 8, <laughs> Far From Athletic 6, Man Titty 3, oh. not doing so well, Butch, these days. They'll no. need a bit of coaching, I think. Yeah. LA Galaxy Bar 2, the Seattle Quarter Pounders 10. So well done, everybody, with the, uh, the Man V Fat. Um, thank you ever so much for being a fantastic capacity crowd. Give yourself a big round of applause. You've been amazing. <laughs> next, week, next week, we'll be back in our usual Life's a Pitch studio. To keep in touch, check out our socials, Facebook, Insta, and Twitter, or X. On YouTube, please, if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. Hit those buttons for us. Help us keep the show going. And don't forget to check out the website for our merch. <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, shirts and we've got mugs and you've got the opportunity to buy tickets for our big event on the 30th of November. That's livesapitch.tv. Uh, and just before we go and I thank our sponsors, we have something very special for you, Pat, which is just about to come onto set now. Um, this is going to be passed along from Phil to Russell to Pat. And it's a token of our appreciation for coming and joining us here tonight. Lovely bunch of flowers for you. No more than you deserve. Yeah, Ted, Ted Lasso's a bit wobbly. Yeah, he's, 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 he needs a bit of a bit emotional. Up. Thank you, Pat, very much. Um, thanks again to our main sponsors, DPS Tech. We're also supported by All About Hearing, marketing company Ginger Pickle, Forward Floors, Come Hither Design, also the Hudson Group, Sound4 Pro Audio, Fred Olson Logistics, and uh, also Keeble's Garage at Bramford, our new sponsor. Thank you once again, Capacity Crowd. Thanks for listening and watching. That's it for now. We'll be back next week. Up the town, everybody! Yeah.